Okay, so last week, we took a look at the first half of Psalm 40. If you recall, I broke it up into six different portions. The first three were salvation, abiding, and obedience. We saw that God is at the center of saving us, is who we abide in, and is who we must serve in the way that He calls us to serve. Not in the way we would serve Him, the way He calls us to. No surprise, but God is at the center of the three sections we're going to study today, which include outreach, desperation, and deliverance and expectation. Now that middle one, desperation, I hope that that pings something in your heart and you go, wait a minute, I've been desperate before. Yeah, I especially want you to pay attention to that. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Psalm 40. And you're going to find a Bible in the seat pocket in front of you. If you don't have yours with you, grab it, open it up. By the way, if you're, if you're relatively new with us and you haven't filled out one of those blue cards, please do. Um, you can give it to any one of the deacons or, or me afterwards, just like an opportunity to invite you to lunch, actually, um, if, you, uh, if you would. So, last week, we studied up through verse 8. Guess where we're going to pick up now? You guess it, verse 9. Yes, this section is about outreach. Now let's take a look at verse 9. Psalm 40, verse 9. Now we all have Psalm 40, right? It's 150 psalms. It's more toward the beginning if you do the math. Psalm 9, I have proclaimed glad tidings of righteousness in the great congregation. Behold, I will not restrain my lips, O Lord, you know. I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I've spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I've not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great congregation. In other words, I, period, have, period, preached, period, boom, drop the mic. That's what that says. I've preached. I recognize that you are all there is, and I can't help but tell somebody. I'm going to put it in, in other words, and I'm jumping into David's skin for a minute. Whether there are believers or unbelievers in Yahweh, I have made known, I have made known to all that would listen the great truths of you, Yahweh. David, when he speaks of God's righteousness here, is not speaking of his judgment, at least not here. Okay, there are times when he talks of God's righteousness, he's talking about his judgment of you. That's not what it is here. Now, when righteousness is used in some context, it refers to God's faithfulness and salvation. And he is both faithful and our Savior. And he alone is righteous. In this case, though, when you read this, it's more than that. It's a relational term that depicts his love and his truth. He's putting things right for you and I. The sinner. How many sinners in the room? Okay, if your hand's not raised, then you just not, you don't know what's up. You're all sinners. Yes, I'm chief sinner among sinners. I've raised two hands. God's putting things right for the sinner, not to God's moral perfection. That happens in glory, not here. Why? Because he knows the truth about us, and he loves us in that truth. Here's the truth for you. He can see you as sinless, not sinful, not the sinful soul he knew before the heavens and the earth were formed. Psalm 139 tells us that he knew us then. He knows us now. He can see you as sinless through the blood of Jesus Christ. Knowing and acknowledging those truths in verse 9 and 10, David goes on. He says, actually, um, actually, I jumped ahead. He says here in, at the end of verse 9, he says, Behold, I will not restrain my lips. I will not restrain my lips. Ever been absolutely and utterly unable to stop yourself from saying something? Mm. 
Yeah, there's, there's a number of us that can say, yeah, I'm normally on a daily basis. Here, David is saying that he just can't hold it in anymore. And he knows that God knows that. I've proclaimed glad tidings of righteousness in the great congregation. Behold, I will not restrain my lips. I can't do it, God. I've got to talk about you. I have to invite people to Easter Sunday. I have to. They have to know about you. It's, it's driving me. It's burning in me. I have to get it out. Do you understand the passion that David is talking with here? Now verse 10 has an A, a B, and a C part to it. I want to look at the middle part first, the B part. The B part says, I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. That's just like in verse 9. Right? In verse 9 he says, I have proclaimed glad tidings of righteousness in the great congregation. And 10b says, I've spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. Except notice the second time it's got a little bit more detail in it. How many folks have taken my Apollos class? Raise your hands. Those people that have taken my Apollos class? Okay, remember the difference between a Greek writing style and a Hebrew writing style. Remember this? A Greek writing style, straight line, even if it's got a peak in it. A Hebrew is circular. This is a great example of Hebrew writing. We're in the Psalms. It's written by the Hebrews. It's in that style. It circles around to the same theme. And each time, it picks up a few more details as it goes. So by the time you hear it four or five times, now you've got the whole picture. Right? You understand that? That's like Hebrew style. This is a piece of paper. Can you all see it? Well, this is a piece of paper that has some writing on it. Can you see? This is a piece of paper that has some writing on it from Thaxton Baptist Church. Can you see that this is a white piece of paper that has some black writing on it from Thaxton Baptist Church that happens to be their order of service and their bulletin? And each time it comes around, you get a little bit more. You see that here in the psalm, too. You see that here in the psalm. Now let's take a look at the beginning of verse 9. It says, again, I've proclaimed glad tidings of righteousness in the great congregation, and I've spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. So what are the glad tidings? That God is faithful and that he will save us. That he is faithful in saving us. Now let's take a look at verse 10 again, but let's look at the A and the C part. Verse 10a, I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great congregation. So if you take a look at those two things, what does it say? I haven't hidden your loving kindness and your truth. Your loving kindness and your truth. What is the truth about God? That he is faithful and that he will save us. Can you see how all of this wraps together? Psalm 22, verses 22 through 24, put it this way. I will tell of your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All of you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him for help, he heard. You see, even more detail in that Hebrew way of telling the story of God and talking about all of God's attributes and how much God loves us. It's another layer of understanding, praise, and joy. So the question is, what about us? How does that impact us? This section right here. How are we preaching? Here David was preaching. How are we preaching? Are we taking crosses home and witnessing in our community? How many did we, did we take home last week? We took 30, I think, right? 
And there was another 10 that were signed up for. 40 crosses were taken from here and hopefully hammered in somewhere in your yard for people to see. And I've seen pictures of them on Facebook, as a matter of fact, which is really neat. That's a way of preaching. It's a way of witnessing. It's a way of evangelizing. It starts conversations. Are we taking the invitations that Justin provided for us and sharing those? Are we sharing our joy with everyone we come in contact with? Because our lips cannot be restrained. Is our life with Christ on display for all to see? Matthew 28 was a direct quote from Jesus. It was not to professional people in the church. It wasn't to leaders, but to the body of the church. He says, go therefore and make disciples. The question is, are we going? Have we put action to that, to go? You don't need to be an evangelist. I'm certainly not an evangelist. You just have to exude the joy that people find infectious and simply invite them to Thaxton to see and hear why. There's a huge mission field right across the field from where you live. Huge mission field right across the field from where you live. Maybe in your field. Now look, this is not a guilt thing, guys. This is not a guilt thing. This is a submission and obedience thing. I'll tell you a true story. In my former life, I had to have a part-time job as I had my first um, my first job as, a, as an associate pastor because we were a small church getting going. So I used to travel around the world and I would train people and teach them in different countries. I was in Germany, just outside of Frankfurt, and I had been there for the better part of a week. And time-wise, you know, I was, wanted to sleep during the day and was wide awake at night and I wasn't getting any sleep. And I was training hard, 10 hours a day, training. People paid a lot of money to be there. To see me. Ooh. They paid a lot of money to be there. And so at the end of the trip, I had a wake-up call at 3.45. Had a cab that was scheduled to be there at 4.45 to take me to the airport. I had a direct flight to L.A. from Frankfurt. I knew I'd probably get a chance to sleep, but I was worn out out so I get into the car the 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 back seat of the cab and I thought to myself I said I'm just done I'm not going to say a word to anybody now until I get on the airplane because there will be just no interaction I'll be okay and this cab driver at that very moment that I said that cab driver turns around he says so I saw that you have a bible what do you know about this Jesus? And I laughed. I laughed out loud. And the guy thought for a minute I was laughing at him or about Jesus. I laughed because here was God saying, yeah, yeah, that's what you think, pal, but here you go. Guess what? I'm going to give you one right now. As it turns out, the guy was a Muslim who was looking into Christianity because so many other people around him had become Christians in Germany. And the whole time I'm sharing my testimony and sharing the gospel with him and I can't wipe the smile off my face. Why? Because I knew that God was so in that whole thing. You've seen those. My my words were still hanging in the air when the guy turned around and asked me the question. So this thing that I just said about are you preaching, are you taking crosses home, are you going into your community, It's not a guilt thing. This is an obedience thing, a submission thing. Yeah, Lord, you know what? You're right. Listen, I'm just going to witness as I witness. I'm just going to be in Christ, and people are going to want a piece of that. Gene Holland, my kids think that you witness Christ so very, very well that both of them coming home this summer said that's the first stop they want to make is at your house again. Okay, Not because Gene whipped out the Bible and started quoting Bible verses, but because the joy bubbles up from the inside out with her. That's what I'm talking about. That's the example that I'm talking about. As we move to our next section now, remember I said there were three sections. The second one, beginning in verse 11, what we hear is desperation. 
desperation. Now you can read this, it's, it's only a couple verses here, you can read this, verse 11 and then verse 12, I'm going to suggest that we read it the other way. We read verse 12 first, and then verse 11. Because I think it makes just a tad more sense. Read, read verse 12 with me. For evils beyond number have surrounded me. My iniquities have overtaken me so that I'm not able to see. They are more numerous than the hairs of my head, and my heart has failed me. You, O Lord, will not withhold your compassion from me. Your loving kindness and your truth will continually preserve me. Where it says in verse 12, my, my evils or my afflictions, these are trials of faith. Or they're corrections for sin that has happened within a walk of faith. We know that if you look at 12b where it says iniquities have overtaken me so that I'm not able to see, 2 Samuel has very similar language. It says, and David is the subject here, and it says, they have overwhelmed me like a flood. How many people besides me have been overtaken as though flooded over with trials and afflictions? You don't need to raise your hands. You know who you are. I've been overtaken by that. We all have. There's not a person here who hasn't at some point felt overwhelmed like a flood, that you felt surrounded by trials. And if, if you felt that as I did, did you also feel like your heart was failing you? That's the feeling of desperation that I, I, I talked about here in Psalm 40. And that's what the theme is right here. Look, look again at the middle of verse 12. It says, they've overtaken me so much that I'm not able to see. In the extreme terror and faintness, David is blinded because he's so afraid, he's so terrified by this. And it says, my courage, my courage, my heart has failed. As great as it may have been, it has failed. Remember, remember who we're talking about here. This is the guy who was very outclassed by size and stature, a very young man that had the courage to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Goliath. He said he's so panicked that he has no sight, he has no courage, and now he's incredibly desperate. This mountain of a man is reduced to little. How counterintuitive. God's mercy and his grace that he would break us of our pride and anything that we held on to in our own lives that we were so desperate that we would turn to him. Because what does desperation do? It causes action. When people become that desperate, they have to do something. Take a look back at verse 4 that we studied last week. It says, How blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust and has not turned to the proud nor to those who lapse into falsehood. There's a choice there that we talked about. I can either trust in God or I can trust in the world. I have a choice. When I'm that desperate, I'm going to go one way or the other. No two ways about it. I'm going one way or the other. Which way are you going to go? What would the world encourage us to do? The world would encourage us to turn to them for comfort. Whatever that comfort is for you. What's at the core of your choice? Go back and read the end of verse 3. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. When you see that fork in front of you, 
If you fear the Lord, you will follow Him. You will follow Him. If you connect that idea of trust as you do that, when you have to decide in your desperation where to align your heart, like, can you you put yourself there when you've been desperate before in your life and you've had a choice of which way to go and where to go? Read verse 11. You, O Lord, will not withhold your compassion from me. Your loving kindness and your truth will continually preserve me. I'm choosing you, God. When you trust this type of confidence you possess, when knowing that God is with you, knowing, not thinking, knowing He is with you, you are never alone. I got another question. How many of us in our desperation have said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? How many of us have said, I'm the only person in the world that feels like this right now? No, they can't understand how bad this is. No, it's just terrible. I feel all alone. There's not a person here who's been desperate who hasn't thought that. 1 Corinthians 10.13 gives us even more perspective in rounding out the how do I operate when desperate question. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. You know what that means? You're not the only one that's ever experienced this. This is a common thing that you're going to experience, whatever it is. And God is faithful. Wait, we just saw that. I've spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. It says, God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. Stop right there. You cannot be tempted beyond what you're able to bear. God won't do that. But, is the next word, but, with the temptation will provide the way of escape also so that you will be able to endure it. I don't care what desperate thing you have in front of you. God always, always, always gives you a way out. Sometimes the ultimate way out is to say, no, I choose you, Lord. No, I I choose you. I don't choose the world, I choose you. I trust in you. And because I trust in you, I'm then going to ask for your deliverance. Look how this entire psalm is woven into itself. How the Old Testament is woven together with the New Testament through Jesus Christ our Lord. What this is talking about right here is the same thing that we see in 1 Corinthians 10.13. And they're joined together through Christ. If anybody ever, has ever told you that these are, well, two separate books... You know, 39 books or, you know, 27 books. No, 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 no. This is, this is one love letter from God. Love letter from God. In the Old Testament, we had the law, which showed us how much we needed a Savior. In the New Testament, we have a Savior. And we've got the Holy Spirit to teach us how much we can't rely on ourselves, but how much we need what? A Savior. That we need God. We need Jesus Christ. This final section is about deliverance and expectation. We have deliverance through a God who has known us and knows us from now through eternity. How much we rely on Him versus ourselves is the measure of our expectation of that deliverance. The more you rely on God, to the degree you rely on God, you expect to be delivered. The degree to which you rely on yourself says you rely on Him less for that deliverance. What is it we expect to be delivered from and what do we expect to be delivered into? How much do we know that we actually need deliverance? What type of God do we know on this side of that deliverance? As we read verses 13 through 17, it's going to give us an idea I want to tell you something about this. These are almost, word for word, identical to all of Psalm 70. 
So all of Psalm 70 is from verse 13 through 17. Just if you want to check that out or or write that down, it's fine. What this is is an urgent call for help. It's a need right now, a petition. I need help. Let's start in verse 13. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. Make haste, O Lord, to help me. Stop right there. Do you notice the difference in tone from here back at verse 1 of Psalm 40? Verse 1 said, I wait patiently for the Lord. And He inclined to me and heard my cry. And this is saying, whoop, whoop, whoop. God, I need help right now. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. Make haste, O Lord, to help me. Let those be ashamed and humiliated together who seek my life to destroy it. Let those be turned back and dishonored who delight in my hurt. Let those be appalled because of their shame who say to me, aha, aha. Let's, let's stop there for just a minute. Oswald Chambers is quoted as saying this. Here we're talking about faith of deliverance. Faith for my deliverance is not faith in God. Faith means whether I'm visibly delivered or not, I will stick to my belief that God is love. There are some things only learned in a fiery furnace. Hmm. What makes diamonds out of coal? Pressure. Pressure. Heat. As we've seen, David is in a fiery furnace here. Okay, as we may be in some type of challenge or fiery furnace. Here's again what he's enduring. Verse 14, let those be ashamed and humiliated together who will seek my life to destroy it. Let those be turned back and dishonored who delight in my hurt. Let those be appalled because of their shame who say to me, aha, aha. Aha, aha is literally the exclamation of malicious pleasure at another's misfortune. Anybody know the story of the Edomites? Jerusalem gets bashed really hard. The Babylonians come in and they're going to take the Jews back to Babylon. And what did, what did the Edomites do? They stand along the side of the road that they're taking them on. And they clap their hands and they cheer and they jeer at them. That's aha, aha. How many people seen an Edomite recently? No, God says, as a matter of fact, God says in His Word, you Edomites will pay for that. You will pay for that. For that dishonor to your brother. That you did not step up to help your brother. Yeah. That aha, aha is not a really good thing. Now David switches here from these wicked guys that he just described. And... And he focuses more on the righteous. Let's take a look at verse 16. Let all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Those who love your salvation and continually, and say continually, the Lord be magnified. Look back on verses 3b and 4a. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. How blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust. Let all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let those who love your salvation rejoice say continually the Lord be magnified and finally David then switches back to himself and makes petition for deliverance with full trust that God will do precisely that see here's the difference and we'll talk about this in a minute since I am afflicted and needy let the Lord be mindful of me you are my help. Not you might be my help. I hope you're my help. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, oh my God. Notice the expectation. David is still asserting his heart's desire, which is for quick delivery. And here we see the difference again from verse 1 where he waited patiently for the Lord. What did David do? Did David ask and then expect? Or did David expect and then ask? Which one shows trust? The second one does. I expect. I know God well enough. I know because I find myself 
in him, and I've preached the fact, I've lived the fact, that God, in his sovereignty, is faithful and he is my salvation, therefore, I can ask. You see the difference there? Versus, hey Lord, I don't know if you're there or not. I'm not really sure what's going to happen, but I need some deliverance. I expect I'm going to get an answer, but I'm not sure what it is. See, David here is saying, I trust fully. I trust, I know. And I'm going to make my heart known to you, Lord. And that's what Psalm 40 is about. It's, It's about God's sovereignty and how much He loves us and cares for us. And that we need to be in touch with that. And we need to share that with other people. It's a fabulous psalm to read to people when they're in the hospital. Hebrews 12.1 tells us to run with endurance the race that is set before us. George Matheson wrote this. He says, we commonly associate patience with lying down. We think of it as the angel that guards the couch of the invalid. Yet there's a patience that I believe to be harder. The patience that can run. To lie down in the time of grief, to be quiet under the stroke of adverse fortune implies a great strength. But I know of something that implies a strength greater still. Matheson goes on, It's the power to work under stress. To have a great weight at your heart and still run. To have a deep anguish in your spirit and still perform the daily tasks. It is a Christ-like thing. The hardest thing is that most of us are called to exercise our patience not in the sickbed, but in the street. To wait is hard. To do it with good courage is harder. And my sermon prep, I read a lot. And I pray a lot. And I don't just read the, the texts that we're studying for the week. As I read Matheson's quote in Psalm 40, I reflected on the past few weeks in my life. And I've been under that kind of stress. It's been that kind of a challenge for me. One who teaches learns twice. And I've had a great reminder about God's faithfulness. And what I want to tell you is, even under all the duress, and there is duress, I've got a great peace. And I can't explain why. Other than the Lord has just The Lord has just blessed me with peace. I want you to know that same kind of peace. We find it here in Psalm 40. We find it in 1 Corinthians 10.13. We find it at the foot of the cross. Praise Him. Hallelujah and amen.